Welcome to today's Monticello live stream. I'm Ann Lucas, the Senior Historian Emerita at Monticello, and I'm so happy that you all have decided to spend your morning with us. So we are together witnessing a moment in Monticello's history. Not only are we anticipating new leadership for our second century, but we are also poised to join a nationwide movement to commemorate the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson's death. I show you this chart of Monticello's visitation so that you can see our high and low water marks shown here in red, deficits brought about by war and COVID in contrast to the heights of visitation we enjoyed in the bicentennial and again in 1993 for the 250th anniversary of Jefferson's birth. To paraphrase John Adams, Monticello survives. There are many resources available for studying the history of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, including a terrific archival exhibition at the Jefferson Library, which also has an online component. Monticello's interim director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies is also the author of an amazing work, Frank Cogliano's Thomas Jefferson, Reputation and Legacy includes an overview of the foundation's history and its role in shaping Jefferson's legacy for the public and scholars. Frank's research expands upon one of my own favorite works, Merrill Peterson's Jefferson Image in the American Mind, which I pay tribute to in the title of this talk. Long before the Thomas Jefferson Foundation was formed in 1923, a curious public recognized that the political and personal threads of Jefferson's life combined at Monticello. And in Peterson's words, of Jefferson more than any other American, it might be said that the history of the inner man was the history of his house. But once Monticello made the transition from private home to public memorial, images such as this 1928 staged photo by the Virginia Chamber of Commerce quite literally put Monticello on the state's tourism map. Monticello's influence on America's built environment began to grow. Our research files are filled with examples of Monticello-inspired buildings. And you may never guess how invested people are in the color of the dining room walls or the Chinese Chippendale railing on the terraces until you change them. Monticello has become part of the American identity, the house on the nickel. So this morning, I wanna introduce you to a Monticello-inspired house, you may not know, that once stood on Boston's North Shore and was furnished with select pieces from Monticello. And in a roundabout way, this house is responsible for the Monticello that we all know today, even though its ruins now rest at the bottom of the sea. Thomas Jefferson Coolidge Jr. shared his namesake's love of architecture. This was one of his homes. Marble Palace, as it was known, was a Neo-Georgian mansion that stretched 230 feet facing the sea. The grandson of Ellen and Joseph Coolidge grew up surrounded by relics from Monticello and steeped in the family tradition of tending to Jefferson's legacy. Coolidge engaged Charles McKim of the famed Boston architecture firm McKim, Mead & White to design a house that would reference Jefferson's architectural designs. The firm was already intimately familiar with Jefferson's designs. They, re they restored the rotunda at the University of Virginia after the 1895 fire there. And they also designed the three new buildings that terminate the South Lawn. The firm began designing Coolidge's house in 1903 and construction was completed in a year. Coolidge was so enamored by the design process that he and his wife, Clara, traveled to Virginia in 1911 to visit the university in Monticello, which was then privately owned by Jefferson Monroe Levy. On that trip, Coolidge found, quote, almost by accident, a cache of architectural drawings owned by his cousins who lived in Charlottesville, including this now iconic drawing by Jefferson of the first Monticello. The drawings had been forgotten, in Coolidge's words, and bore evidence of having suffered from damp and mice. Coolidge obtained the entire collection and brought them to the Massachusetts Historical Society, 
where his father had donated over 8,000 Jefferson items in 1898. These included over 3,000 letters written by Jefferson and nearly 5,000 letters received by him. Jefferson's garden book and farm book, some of Jefferson's account books, his weather memoranda spanning 44 years, legal papers, and his 1783 catalog of his personal library. The drawings were in the process of being conserved when Coolidge died unexpectedly at age 49, and it had been his intent to study and preserve them for his descendants, as he said, as a precious record of a phase of Jefferson's activities as yet little understood. Coolidge's discovery not only established that Jefferson designed buildings, but also that he designed landscapes, furniture, curtains, farm buildings, roads, and gardens. Seemingly no detail was too small to escape his attention. These drawings and memoranda inform everything we know about Monticello, and together with Jefferson's manuscripts, they form one of the most complete records of plantation life anywhere in the world. After Thomas Jefferson Coolidge Jr.'s death, his widow, Clara Amory Coolidge, engaged the scholar Fisk Kimball to study and publish the drawings as a tribute to her husband. The Grand Folio Thomas Jefferson Architect was published in 1916 and reflected the work of both Fisk and his wife, Marie Kimball, an able historian who would become Monticello's first curator. The landmark study incorporates information from Jefferson's letters, account books, memorandum books, and journals to create a framework and a numbering system for his architectural efforts that is still relied upon by scholars to this day. The Kimballs occupied Jefferson's mind in such a way that established their authority. Of the more than 400 drawings in the Coolidge collection, 245 of them are for Monticello. These include pages of specifications from Jefferson's building notebooks, slave dwellings, surveys and plats, outbuildings, observation towers, clocks, parquet floor, entablatures, garden pavilions, a brew house, and domes. Again, this flood of discoveries, scholarship, and publishing is all happening while Monticello is still the private residence of Jefferson Monroe Levy. So in order to understand the history of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, one must begin during Monticello's ownership by the Levy family. Commodore Uriah Levy first rescued Monticello from disrepair in 1834. Ownership of the property was in dispute and litigation for 13 years, beginning at the start of the Civil War, during which time the property became derelict. It was Uriah Levy's nephew, Jefferson Monroe Levy, who once again rescued Monticello, restoring the house and grounds and even seeking to acquire original Jefferson artifacts. The Levy family's almost 90-year tenure at Monticello far exceeded Jefferson's own. Their stewardship ensured Monticello's survival, a story that could be a talk of its own, and one more fully told by author Mark Leapson and the filmmaker Stephen Pressman. Jefferson Levy typically only spent the summer months at Monticello. Visitors were welcomed through these gates and past the gatekeeper's lodge, which Levy built in 1880. It housed gatekeeper Eliza Coleman and her family, shown here in this Rufus Holsinger photograph. Coleman's extended family continued to work at Monticello for the Thomas Jefferson Foundation through the 1950s, and her descendants were among the earliest participants in Monticello's Getting Word oral history project. Now, Levy had been approached to sell Monticello numerous times, but around the turn of the century, pressure began to build from multiple fronts beginning with William Jennings Bryan and fueled in many instances by anti-Semitic rhetoric. A 1909 visitor named Maud Littleton led a national campaign to take Monticello from Levy, whom she called a rank outsider, and transform it into a shrine to Thomas Jefferson. Her efforts led to a series of hearings on Capitol Hill, 
in the summer of 1912, when both her husband and Jefferson Monroe Levy were senators. Levy resisted the call to sell Monticello, famously saying that when the White House was for sale, he would consider selling Monticello. But by 1914, Levy agreed that if it was the will of the people, he would sell to the U.S. for $500,000. The First World War interrupted Littleton's pressure campaign, and by 1919, Levy had engaged a real estate agent and advertised Monticello for sale himself. Meanwhile, two additional groups led by women tried but failed to raise the funds to meet Levy's purchase price. As the foremost scholar on Jefferson's architecture, Fisk Kimball naturally became involved in these discussions, and he even acted as a go-between when Levy had hoped to sell the house to the Coolidges in 1917 with his essay, Thomas Jefferson as an Architect, as part of this real estate brochure. In a March 1923 American Institute of Architects report, Kimball made a pitch for public ownership on the grounds that the building was now in serious disrepair and too much for even the most devoted private citizen to finance. Furthermore, Kimball argued for a once in a lifetime opportunity. The Jefferson drawings that he recently found made it, in his words, perfectly feasible to put the place back exactly in the form it had in his lifetime. On April 13th, 1923, just a few weeks after that report was published, the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation was incorporated in Albany, New York for the purpose of establishing Monticello as a memorial to the author of the Declaration of Independence and for the purpose of inculcating through patriotic education a better understanding and appreciation of the life and service of Thomas Jefferson. It was led by prominent New York lawyers, mostly Democrats, with ties to Virginia. Kimball immediately wrote to the foundation's president, Stuart Gibney, sending a copy of that AIA report and offering his assistance with what he called the admirable effort to purchase and preserve Monticello, saying it was an answer to our wish. Kimball offered to make connections with national organizations like the AIA, donate his services based on his very detailed study of Jefferson's architectural drawings, and use his influence with the Coolidge family to aid in securing Jefferson relics to furnish Monticello. And in the end, both Fisk and Marie Kimball would go on to donate their services to the foundation for more than 30 years. Gibney immediately accepted Fisk's assistance and offered him a place in the foundation's leadership with this letter. It's now in the Kimball papers at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Written on brand new foundation stationery, the letter is covered with Kimball's distinctive pencil notes and annotations. One of his habits that has helped me and many Monticello researchers, though I will note that he also felt free to write numbers on Jefferson's drawings. Kimball's tick marks on the list of the Board of Governors indicates those whom he knew, such as Edwin Alderman, president of the University of Virginia, and Lady Astor. His pencil notes indicate that he's had a phone call with Gibney in which they've discussed the finances of the foundation. Levy had proposed an asking price of 500,000, with 100,000 due at the end of 1923, leaving a $400,000 balance to mortgage for the house, its contents, including some Jefferson artifacts, and the surrounding 650 acres. Letters are the coin of the realm in the early foundation, with Kimball in Philadelphia, where he was director of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the foundation's headquarters in Gibney in New York, restoration architects and caretakers in Charlottesville. In an era of twice daily mail delivery, the archives offer a wealth of information. I've outlined in yellow some of the leaders in the early failed efforts to transform Levy's summer home into a patriotic shrine. And while these names appear on the early Board of Governors, their influence was minimal and faded, uh, while in comparison to that of Fisk Kimball and Stuart Gibney, who went on to transform Monticello. Following the purchase, Stuart Gibney went down to Virginia with a newly hired assistant, Theodore Fred Cooper, who I think might be considered the foundation's first employee. 
Cooper was a Russian immigre and a lawyer. He and Gibney, a native Virginian, met with Thomas Rhodes, who's the second on the left in the left photo. Levy's caretaker, who went on to work for the foundation through the 1940s. Cooper referred to Rhodes as a, quote, worshiper of Thomas Jefferson. He had read and reread an early biography of him until it was a dog-eared wreck. Rhodes was also a passionate supporter of the lost cause. He flew the Confederate flag above his cottage, which I presume was what came to be called the Weaver's Cottage, now the textile workshop. Cooper instructed Rhodes to keep the flag within the confines of his home. Visitors were to be charged 50 cents and given a receipt with Jefferson's signature on it. Robert Sampson, William Page, and Benjamin Carr were among a group of local black men who had worked for Rhodes and would serve as guides, continuing in a mode long established during Levy's tenure. Foundation leaders immediately launched campaigns to raise a million dollars to satisfy the mortgage and stabilize the property. They had the dual task of educating the public about Thomas Jefferson, then more on the margins of awareness, and also about Monticello, which had always attracted the curious and faithful, but was not nationally known. Their methods included stunts, such as Virginia Governor E. Lee Trinkle riding on the streets of New York City in Jefferson's gig, part of a procession from Monticello that included stops in Washington, where President Wilson met the gig and made a contribution, and in Philadelphia. In 1927, they illuminated Monticello with what was said to be the largest searchlight in the world, mounted three miles away in Charlottesville on the top of the newly constructed Monticello Hotel. As Merrill Peterson writes, the foundation did not let up, nor did it confine its activities to Monticello. The foundation, not the government, was the chief agent of Jefferson commemoration. The enormous searchlight it turned on Monticello in 1927 was a fair symbol of its illumination of Jefferson. Fred Cooper arrived at the solution of combining education and fundraising by taking Jefferson and Monticello to thousands of school children, by celebrating Jefferson's birthday in the schools with the recitation of the Patriots Pledge of Faith and a penny campaign. As the nation's centennial drew near in 1926, there was renewed scholarly and public interest in Jefferson. Monticello was to be Jefferson's memorial, something that was especially relevant to the public with the dedication of Lincoln's memorial in 1925. Kimball was unanimously voted to chair the foundation's restoration department and immediately began the work of stabilization. The foundation had very limited funds for anything other than paying off Monticello's mortgage and worked creatively with outside organizations like the Civilian Conservation Corps Clearing the Woods and the Department of Agriculture's Bureau of Public Roads providing funds for the entrance exit road. Local architect Milton Grigg came to be Kimball's trusted partner for Monticello's restoration, along with the local construction firm, R.E. Lee and the Vanieri's Tree Company, whose arborists actually relocated their firm from New York to Charlottesville because of their association with Monticello. Griggs' primary fame among the staff now is as the architect of what was once a ticket office on Mulberry Row, now known as the Grigg Building. There is an equal amount of work to be done to refurnish Monticello. Jefferson Monroe Levy had managed to acquire several important Monticello pieces and preserve others that were fixtures of the house, such as the great clock in Monticello's entrance hall, the brackets in the tea room, and the pier mirrors in the parlor. These, though, were surrounded by later Victorian pieces. Through sales and auctions, the Kimballs would rid Monticello of anything they deemed to be non-Jefferson, sometimes an error, as was the case with the removal of the brackets for Monticello's entrance hall, which are barely visible in the photo on the right. Once the Kimballs had removed all evidence of the Levy family, the place was barren. 
The foundation received a steady stream of complaints as well as offers of Jefferson relics, as they were called. Owners were motivated by the hope of monetary gain, nostalgia, a sense of duty, or a combination of the three. Gibbony would get the details, some happily accompanied by a photo, and send them off to Fisk, sometimes several in one letter, and await his verdict. Doubtless, Marie was closely involved in these deliberations as she published two seminal articles in Antiques Magazine on the furnishings of Monticello. One of Fisk Kimball's enduring legacies is the start of what Monticello's director, Jim Baer, would name the locator files, where Kimball and Gibbony would keep track of the many objects that their owners claimed to have been owned by Jefferson at Monticello, including those in the collections of other museums. As the Kimballs sought out objects, they visited descendants in their homes, gently probed about cousins who might have relics, and circulated Marie's articles to the Monticello Association, which is the organization of Jefferson descendants who owns and maintains the graveyard at Monticello. Fisk was patient but persistent in his correspondence with those who owned artifacts. And the line, quote, I suppose there's absolutely no chance you would part with blank, was often employed, especially in the 1940s, once the foundation had satisfied the mortgage and funds were more readily available for acquisitions. In a letter inquiring about the value of an oval table that she owned, a descendant wrote, the mahogany was brought from South America and the table was made at Monticello by Jefferson's slaves under his directions. It was used at Monticello in the tea room, so I have always been told. As if he needed reminding, she added that when Fisk and Marie had lunched with her, that was the table they had used. Monticello is still in conversation with the owners of this table today and happily have a reproduction of it on display. You'll recall that Kimball offered his services in persuading the Coolidges to donate their Jefferson items. The family had already donated items to other institutions decades before the foundation was begun, including the octagonal filing table, the lap desk on which Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, Gilbert Stewart's medallion portrait of Jefferson, and the Udon busts of Washington, Franklin, and the Marquis de Lafayette. Kimball began to keep track of Jefferson items in other institutions too, which is where our paths intersected as I worked to assemble loans for the 1993 exhibition, The Worlds of Thomas Jefferson at Monticello. These two watercolors by the Richmond, Virginia artist, Jane Braddock Petacolas were also part of the Coolidge family collection and they likely hung at the Marble Palace. In fact, they were supposedly commissioned by Ellen Coolidge in 1825 after she married and left Monticello to move to Boston. Kimball was certainly aware of these paintings, which came to be known as the Braddock Views, but because they had never hung in Monticello in Jefferson's lifetime, he categorized them as non-Jefferson, and they existed in a purgatory of things related to Monticello that had no place in Kimball's collection policy. No American president did more to promote the Jefferson image in the American mind than Franklin Delano Roosevelt, shown here delivering his July 4th speech from the West Portico in 1936. As the bicentennial of Jefferson's birth approached in 1943, Roosevelt's administration supported the creation of the Jefferson Memorial on the National Mall, adding Jefferson and Monticello to the nickel, the funding for the papers of Thomas Jefferson documentary editing project. With his chief of staff, General Edmund, Edwin M. Watson, living nearby at Kenwood, Roosevelt became a steady presence, bringing friends and politicians for weekend retreats in the country. It was a high watermark for Jefferson's reputation and Monticello's attendance. 1951 was the first year that more than 200,000 visitors came to the site. One of the foundation's earliest allies remains among its strongest supporters. The Garden Club of Virginia was the first organization to donate funds for the restoration of Monticello's landscape with a gift of $10,000 in 1926 to assist with the stabilization of the trees. 
They gave another 10,000 in 1938 to restore Monticello's West Lawn. Kimball wrote to their president, Sue Massey, I think today we all feel more kindly to the ideal of putting things back the way they were, irrespective of whether we ourselves wanted to do them just that way or not. Kimball found a sympathetic partner in Garden Club member Hazelhurst Perkins, who affirmed, we are not landscaping Monticello on our own, but carrying out Mr. Jefferson's plans in detail. It has no interest to me or value unless we work in the original plans. The history of restoration at Monticello bears out the idea that the Kimball scientific approach stimulated enthusiasm on the part of others who eagerly took up the challenge of bringing Jefferson's plans, or at least their perception of Jefferson's plans, to fruition. Kimball's approach also created a structural blindness at Monticello to anything vernacular, impermanent, or otherwise undocumented by Jefferson. Monticello's longtime curator, Susan Stein, is among my colleagues who've led the charge to correct Kimball's view. In Susan's words, Kimball's restoration work yielded a landscape that is incomplete as it was devoid of spaces and buildings associated with slavery. Peter Hatch has also written about the tensions that arose over the question of whether to restore the garden to Jefferson's drawings and diagrams or the physical evidence that remained. This is, as I would put it, a congenital dilemma. The fact that other historic sites were being reconstructed at this time, think Colonial Williamsburg, added to an urgency for authenticity in the face of questions from visitors wanting to know whether something was in fact real. The quest for authenticity reached a crisis in 1951 when a long simmering dissatisfaction with the interpretation associated with Thomas Rhodes and the local black men who served as guides led to a vote by the foundation's trustees to reverse the roles of the black guides and the white hostesses, who up until then had greeted guests, taken their ticket, and assigned them to a guide. As the later director, Jim Baer, assessed the change, presentation of the house was improved, even if it meant an end to the numerous and exaggerated but delightful tales reaching well beyond Thomas Jefferson's recognized abilities and accomplishments. One of these guides was Willis Henderson, who was the grandson of Monticello gatekeeper Willis Shelton, and whose family had lived in the Levy Gatehouse. Henderson was born, born at Monticello during the Levy ownership and worked for the family as a cook, waiter, and house guide. He greeted visitors at Monticello through the 1960s, including Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Descendants of the Black Guides are also participants in Monticello's Getting Word oral history project. Getting Word would not be possible were it not for the scholarship and leadership of Monticello's first resident director, James A. Bear Jr. A scholar and librarian, two-time veteran, Jim Bear's term began following Fisk Kimball's death in 1955. Despite being more at home among manuscripts than royalty, Bear led Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip on their visit to Monticello during America's bicentennial. One trustee recalled that the queen had done her homework that day addressing each guest who had been instructed to arrange themselves alphabetically with an antidote or comment particular to them. Among Bear's first acts was the acquisition of the Monticello portion of Fisk Kimball's papers from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The sooner the better, in his words. If letters were Kimball's mode of communication, then Jim Bear's was the report. Fresh from working in special collections at the University of Virginia, Bear tackled the monumental task of organizing and codifying Kimball's and the Foundation's papers. He was a prodigious researcher, compiling reports on everything from Jefferson's bookmarks to family portraits, Jefferson's daily movements, and the Hemings family. His affiliation with the university led to numerous exhibitions and special collections and what was then known as the Bailey Art Museum, now the Fralin. Bear 
instigated a gift from the foundation to special collections for the purpose of acquiring Jefferson manuscripts. He launched the Jefferson Medals in Law and Architecture and the endowment of the Thomas Jefferson Professor of History, a position first given to Dumas Malone. Bear was also the first foundation staff person to write about slavery at Monticello. During his 30-year tenure, Bear's curiosity about the human dimension of the plantation resulted in the first excavations of Mulberry Row, the main street of the Monticello plantation, and with Cinder Stanton, the editing and annotation of Jefferson's memorandum books. <clears throat> Excuse me. It seems that every administration at Monticello was welcomed by a roof restoration project. And I put this here as a reminder that while Bear was busy working in the archive, he was also managing an increasingly popular historic site that was looking ahead to the increased visitation anticipated by the Bicentennial. At the start of his administration, the mountaintop was full of cars. This aerial from around 1974 shows parking on both the Vegetable Garden and Mulberry Row. Board meetings in the early foundation years often began with the price of gas and the price of rubber, as both had a direct impact on visitation and revenue. With the opening of the Skyline Drive in 1936 and the Blue Ridge Parkway in the mid-1950s, it was clear that cars were a permanent part of the Monticello landscape, and also clear that the bicentennial visitation would more than overwhelm existing facilities. Under Bear's leadership, the mountain was cleared of visitor vehicles. In 1972, visitors were first shuttled from a shuttle bus station located near the site of the current visitor center to the mountaintop. And that's a path we have followed ever since. Bear also opened a series of walking paths, including the reconstructed one down Mulberry Row to the graveyard. Jim Bear assembled a team that continues to impact Monticello today. With Jim prodigiously researching and building on Fisk Kimball's work, he brought in young talent in the name of Bill Beiswanger, Peter Hatch, and Cinder Stanton. And they went on to accomplish volumes, but I'm showing their signature projects under Mr. Bear's leadership. Bill Beiswanger's first job at Monticello was to make measured drawings of the furniture as part of disaster preparedness, with the goal being to document the collection so that it and the house could be replicated in case of the unthinkable. And copies of those drawings were distributed across the country to UVA, UNC, and the Huntington. Bill arrived at Monticello with a passion for landscape architecture, and the firm or Ornay and the restoration of the Grove were among his projects. And he collaborated with Peter and archeologist Bill Kelso on the restoration of Jefferson's 1000 foot vegetable garden and the reconstruction of the garden pavilion. Jim Bear asked around UVA for someone smart who could write and Cinder Stanton arrived, first typing out accession cards and then warming to the allure of researching and editing Jefferson's memorandum books. It was during this time that Cinder told me she would make note whenever she encountered the name of someone who was enslaved. And when she noticed that box, as she referred to it, was getting full, then she knew where she wanted to direct her focus. I asked her once about the, what I thought was a metaphorical box, and she said, no, no, it actually was a box. And I do, in fact, remember the box in her office. She and Mr. Bear started editing the memorandum books in earnest in the mid-1970s. Bear considered it the single most important research work Monticello had ever produced. One of Mr. Bear's classic reports was written in 1978 for the board's ad hoc committee on interpretation. In it, he said, the staff for many years has wanted to include the garden grounds as part of our active presentation of the property. To accomplish this requires expertise that has not been available on staff. Fortunately, it is now here in the person of Peter Hatch, superintendent of grounds. Peter jokes that his job was just to hand out weed eaters, but we all know otherwise. 
It would no doubt horrify Jim Bear to know that this uncharacteristic image of him sitting on Jefferson's bed with the actress and singer Ethel Merman would be part of the centennial story. He counted the restoration of Jefferson's bedchamber and cabinet as among his most significant contributions to the interpretation of Jefferson. And if you can imagine, until Jim Bear's arrival, there were virtually no books in Jefferson's library. He recognized the need to convey the vastness of Jefferson's collection and by extension, his intellect and interests. And he set into motion the acquisition of Jefferson's retirement library, working with book dealers to purchase the same titles that Jefferson owned and reconstructing the book boxes that held them. He recalled getting chewed out by the board when they mistakenly believed that he had been shopping for books based solely on their size. It was during the bicentennial that Monticello reached its highest ever visitation, 671,486 souls. Among the year's highlights were the opening of the Eye of Jefferson exhibition at the National Gallery of Art, curated by Monticello trustee Howard Adams, fireworks on the National Mall launched from a model of Monticello, Chief Justice Warren Burger presiding over the July 4th naturalization ceremony, and President Gerald Ford delivering an address at Monticello the day following, culminating then with the visit from Queen Elizabeth. It was Jim Baer who brought archeologist Bill Kelso to the mountaintop. There were early archeological investigations at Monticello in 1957 on Mulberry Row, but it wasn't until 1979 that the foundation had a sustained archeology span program. Kelso conducted more extensive excavations on Mulberry Row in the 1980s, locating nine additional structures, including three not previously known from the documentary record. Kelso's work garnered national attention and firmly established archeological investigation as fundamental to the foundation's dual mission of preservation and education. We owe this view, now so iconic, to both Jim Baer and to his successor, Dan Jordan. Baer had the vision to restore the vegetable garden and the garden pavilion, and Dan Jordan had the leadership to secure Monticello's view shed and imagine a scholarly center on Mon Alto. The transition between the two administrations was nicely summed up by Monticello trustee Frank Berkeley in his oral history. The foundation's education mission broadened with Dan Jordan, I think he could see the place so differently. He could see it as an educational institution, as a museum that exhibited Jefferson and his times and went at it very broadly. Jim Bear understood what it ought to be and Dan made it what it ought to be. Daniel P. Jordan became Monticello's director in 1985 and was at the helm for Jefferson's 250th birthday in 1993 a commemoration with enduring impact and Monticello's second highest visitation. That image on, of Dan trailing behind the Clintons and the Gore speaks volumes. If I had to pick a medium that characterizes Dan Jordan, it would be a toss up between the ubiquitous three by five index card he keeps in his pocket and the prodigious master plans he led the staff to complete, soliciting our best thoughts on the foundation's goals and initiatives. Dan's philosophy was that 1993 wasn't just an excuse for a celebration, but a moment to launch major initiatives. In the landmark exhibition and catalog, The Worlds of Thomas Jefferson at Monticello, Susan Stein and I and our team built on the Kimball's efforts to locate original Monticello artifacts and for the first time, situated Monticello's material culture within the context of Jefferson's political career, family life, and intellectual pursuits. 1993 also saw the founding of the Getting Word Oral History Project for the descendants of Monticello's enslaved community, the establishment of the Papers of Thomas Jefferson Retirement Series, and the start of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. Peter Hatch dreamed up the Monticello Evening Conversation series of scholarly garden parties. Planning began for the Thomas Jefferson Parkway. The roof was restored yet again, 
and the Historic American Building Survey made measured drawings of the house. One of the first 1993 initiatives to pay off, literally, was the Jefferson Commemorative Coin. The bill to create the coin became law in December 1993, and the coin was unveiled on Founders Day the following year. The ceremony included the director of the Mint, and here we see Dan Jordan and Foundation Board Chair Lee Cochran unveiling the design. The coin generated $5 million in profit and established Monticello's endowment, which today stands at over $300 million and supports every aspect of our work. I can't possibly include everyone in today's presentation who deserves to be recognized, but I've chosen just a few faces to rep represent so many valued colleagues that I've worked with over the past 30 years. Peggy Cornett has the distinction of being the most senior staff person at Monticello today. Hired by Peter Hatch during Jim Bear's era, Peggy's first role here was to create the garden tours and guide program. After the founding of the Center for Historic Plants in 1986, Peggy found a home there and remains our curator of historic plants. Her wildflower walks are still highly sought after. And anyone who worked at Monticello in the 1990s would recall the triumvirate of Susan Stein, Paula Faust, Newcomb, and Ann Taylor. Susan Stein joined Dan Jordan the year after he began and continued, continues to distinguish herself as a scholar, author, and curator who pushed beyond the boundaries of Kimball and Bear, starting with the 93 exhibition and continuing through her leadership of the Visitor Center and the transformational Mountaintop Project. And remember the Braddock watercolor views we looked at earlier? Susan Stein acquired them and exhibited them at Monticello for the first time. Paula Faust Newcomb was the Director of Development, Marketing, and Communications, which meant that she was responsible not only for a $100 million fundraising campaign, but also for Monticello's newsletter. Ann Taylor's terms as CFO and Executive Vice President saw Monticello's entry into the World Wide Web, the growth of online and catalog retail sales, and more recently, the successful management of the, two, of the $20 million mountaintop restoration project. Continuing Monticello's tradition of archeological innovation, Director Fraser Nyman began the landmark Monticello Plantation Archeological Survey in 1997. Archaeologists have dug a sample test pit every 40 feet and increased the density to every 20 feet whenever they encounter artifacts. They've completed about 26,000 pits on 655 acres, and the high density zones on the map represent identified archaeological sites. Funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation furthered Monticello's archaeological work with a new initiative to establish common nomenclature and protocols known as DACs the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, bringing together scholars from sites of enslavement across the world. One of the 93 initiatives that continues today is the Plantation Community Program, which resulted in the introduction of Plantation Community Weekends and Slavery Tours. This brochure, masterminded by Susan Stein and Cinder Stanton, invited visitors to imagine a world beyond Jefferson and the home, or even what remained visible to the eye. Several of the buildings shown here as artists' renderings have since been added to the landscape as part of the Mountaintop Project. In 1993, the Thomas Jefferson Parkway Project received $1.5 million in federal intramodal surface transportation efficiency act funds, known as an ICE-T grant. The parkway not only expanded visitors' opportunities within the landscape, but it also protected Monticello's entry corridor. Opened in 2000, the parkway, two-mile Saunders Monticello Trail, and 89-acre Kemper Park consistently ranks as one of the most popular attractions in Central Virginia, and it broadens Monticello's impact in our community. During the Jordan era, thorny questions like the Sally Hemings DNA study were met with a commitment to scholarship, summed up in the statement on the TJMF Research Committee report on Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. 
and I'm quoting, when the DNA study was released on the evening of October 31st, 1998, the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation responded immediately. Within 24 hours, we held a press conference with Dr. Eugene Foster, principal author of the study, posted a statement on our website, and instructed our interpreters to initiate conversations with our visitors about the study. The foundation also pledged that it would evaluate the scientific results and all other relevant evidence in a systematic and comprehensive way, and that we would, in the Jeffersonian tradition, follow truth wherever it may lead. We believe it offers opportunities for the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation that it, and that it will advance our firm belief in telling a story here that is accurate and honest and thus inclusive about Jefferson's remarkable life and legacy in the context of the complex and extraordinary plantation community that was Monticello. In an interview with PBS's Frontline, Cinder Stanton described how the DNA study forever changed her life, dividing it into two parcels, before DNA and after DNA. In 2018, the foundation determined that it was time to remove the qualifiers from its interpretation of Sally Hemings and issued a statement affirming that Jefferson fathered children with Sally Hemings. The foundation's archives, including everything related to the DNA study and the research library received a handsome home in 2001 when the Jefferson Library was dedicated on the grounds of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies. The result of visionary trustees accelerating our master plan, the library serves as a hub for researchers and ICJS fellows off-site and on. Housed in the upper suite of the library is the editorial pro editorial uh, suite of the Papers of Thomas Jefferson Retirement Series, which was launched during the foundation's 75th anniversary in 1998. It published its first volume in 2004 and remained steady through the pandemic. 2009 marked a new era for Monticello with the completion of a state-of-the-art LEED Gold Certified Visitor Center. The facility was dedicated by Leslie Green Bowman, who one year earlier had succeeded Dan Jordan as Monticello's president. Home to Monticello's education department, museum shop, galleries, and theater, the visitor center made visible the foundation's commitment to education. Monalto is also a tribute to scholarship and to the vision of Monticello's most generous donor, Robert H. Smith. Home to the conferences sponsored by the International Center for Jefferson Studies, Repose is perched on top of the mountain that Jefferson named Mon Alto. This high mountain was Jefferson's first land purchase and rises 410 feet above Monticello, protecting its view while providing inspiring vistas. Monticello's longstanding efforts to understand and interpret race and the legacy of slavery resulted in the 2012 exhibition, Slavery at Jefferson's Monticello, Paradox of Liberty, shown at the Smithsonian American History Museum. Viewed by one, over one million visitors on the National Mall, a traveling version of the show has been installed in cities across the country, including Atlanta, Dallas, St. Louis, Detroit, and the Black History Museum and Cultural Center in Richmond. American presidents have come to Monticello from Jefferson's time to the present, but 2014 marked the first time that the presidents of two countries arrived together, French President Francois Hollande and U.S. President Barack Obama. President Obama remarked that Monticello represents the incredible bond and the incredible gifts that France gave to the United States. And of course, this house also represents the complicated history of the United States. It's a reminder for both of us that we are going to continue to fight on behalf of the rights of all peoples. Just two years after hosting a public summit on race with the National Endowment for the Humanities and the University of Virginia, Monticello celebrated the 25th anniversary of Getting Word, bringing together the descendants of the enslaved, Monticello's trustees, and supporters in a celebration of the Oral History Project, the, su the successful completion of the We Hold These Truths fundraising campaign, 
and the conclusion of the Mountaintop Project. The future for Getting Word is bright. Now led by participant Andrew Davenport, Getting Word was recently awarded $3.5 million in support from the Mellon Foundation. With seed funding from philanthropist David Rubenstein, the foundation undertook its most ambitious period of restoration since Kimball's time. Mountaintop Project was a five-year initiative begun in 2013 that saw the completion of nearly 30 newly restored or recreated spaces and exhibits. The foundation's decades of investment in research were evident in every aspect of that work. Rooms on every level of the house received updated interpretation and the upper floors were comprehensively restored and furnished for the first time. The Braddock watercolor of Monticello's West Front provided evidence that led to the replacement of Mon Monticello's iconic Chinese Chippendale railing with the more accurate, but less beloved, green picket railing. On Mulberry Row, buildings and landscapes were restored or reconstructed, including the original Kitchen Road, a project funded by the Garden Club of Virginia. And perhaps most meaningful, the Life of Sally Hemings exhibit was installed in the South Wing, where restrooms had once occupied the rooms where she and her family lived. On March 16, 2020, Monticello closed for three months as dictated by the COVID pandemic. That same day, our digital team, who's leading our efforts this morning, offered online guided live virtual tours, adapting overnight a product developed for school programs into a lifeline for live interactions with virtual visitors. Our education and visitor program staff redefined the house tour to be self-guided and Monticello reopened to the public on June 13th with increased health and safety protocols and reduced guest capacity. Relief from NEH Cares, the Reynolds Foundation, and the Fidelity Foundation, in addition to the Payroll Protection Program, supported Monticello during the stresses of COVID, from which it continues to recover. Two projects that were on the design boards during the COVID closure have just recently been dedicated. The redesigned burial for enslaved people and the contemplative site, both designed by Peter Cook of HGA Architects, with landscape design by Thomas Woltz. Located in the grove within sight of Mulberry Row, the contemplative site remembers the 607 enslaved people who labored and lived at Monticello. A 60 foot long wall of Corton steel is etched with the names arranged in order of date of birth or the first known appearance in Jefferson's records with space for the names of those yet to be uncovered from the obscurity of slavery. What started as 650 acre as a 650 acre historic site in 1923 today stands at nearly 3000 acres with the most recent acquisition of the 400 acre Jefferson Vineyard property. This brings us to just about half of the land that Jefferson owned at Monticello. And of that land that Monticello owns, about half again is under protective easements. And I'll end today with the Braddock views and words from our trustee and former board chair, Melody Barnes. I would like visitors to come to Monticello and realize that this mountaintop is one of the most important places in America. It tells the story of America's aspirations, innovation, and paradoxes. And as important as Monticello is to the past, it is also a powerful place for education and contemplation to help us grapple with 21st century challenges. As we think about what lies ahead and the blind spots we may have, I wanna challenge us all to look at these two paintings. Again, the one so familiar, as it has been exploited by retail and plastered on the cover of countless books. But what about the other? The view from Monticello of eroded lands, precarious roads, cultivated fields, and a nascent university. As long as the economic engine of the plantation, its rivers, fields, and sheer scale remain hidden from view, we too tell an incomplete story. There is still work to do in our next century. And I'm delighted to be able to end today's talk with the exciting news that the Thomas Jefferson Foundation trustees have named the distinguished author and historian Jane, Dr. Jane Kaminsky as Monticello's next president to lead us into the next century and to involve us all 
in the important conversations that Monticello demands. She'll begin her work on January 15th, 2024, as we begin our next century. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I know we covered a lot um, and I'm sure if you have questions, um, the staff and I would be happy to respond to them in the comments. Uh, and if you liked what you saw, please subscribe or like our channel. You'll get notifications for upcoming live streams. And finally, we hope that you'll join us at Monticello in person for our Centennial Day on Saturday, December 2nd. There'll be details about that event on our website and in the comments. Thanks so much and have a great morning.